Fish are some of the most diverse, charismatic, and weird animals on the planet. Everyone has an idea about what the coolest animal is. Lions, tigers, crocodiles. Me, I am a fish nut. I love fish. I love catching them, I love eating them, and I've made a career out of studying them. Why, people ask me, do you love fish so much? And it all started when I was about five. I was at a fishing lodge, and thanks to an enormous stuffed trout up on the wall, I was very, very small, the fish was very, very big. I had wide eyes, I was looking up at it. The old guy that ran the lodge came up with his cane. He pointed his cane up and he said, we caught that one right off the beach. From that point forward, I was terrified of fish. Terrified. I wouldn't go in the water unless someone else was in the water. And if they weren't eaten, then I'd get in. But I wasn't going to be the last one in the water. I got out of there. My fear became an obsession. Anytime I was around water, I wanted to see fish. I wanted to get a glimpse of those crazy, scary creatures that lurked below the surface. That obsession became a passion, and I've made a career out of filming how these things move and studying how they move. So this is a movie that I took in my lab. It's a trout. It's swimming in a flow tunnel. A flow tunnel is like a treadmill for fish. So I can change the speed of the water, the fish swims in the same place. If you look really closely at the movie, you'll see this fish is wired up. He's got little electrodes that we've put into his muscles. When muscles contract, they give off an electrical signal. We can use that signal and look at how he's moving his fins to get an idea about how they use their muscles to move their fins when they're swimming. So in doing this, I've discovered fish can do a lot of amazing things with their fins when they're in the water. But I wanted to take it one step further. I wanted to know, what can they do with their fins when they're on land? People, of course, said, well, why? Why do you want to put a fish on land? And my answer to this is, I like looking at animals' limits. How far can you push them? How good can they be? What can they do with the bodies they've got? The second thing, people say, still, fish on land? Like, study a cheetah. Fish on land is interesting, guys, and I have to tell you a little story about your family history to make you understand. About 400 million years ago, that is a long time, every vertebrate on the planet was a fish. So think about that. There were no animals with internal bone structure on land. Everything was a fish. And that water was a very dynamic place, filled with enormous predators. This is Dunkleosteus. See the teeth in that thing's head? They're not actually teeth, they're skull bones that grow into its mouth. This thing is a formidable predator, grew up to 10 meters long, ate everything in its path. At the same time, the sea was filled with all sorts of different fish. So if you weren't getting eaten by Dunkleosteus, somebody was either eating your food, living in your space, and generally making it very difficult to survive. Flash up now onto land. Remember I said that there are no vertebrates on land, but there are some lovely plants, plants that started to invade the terrestrial landscape. So had invertebrates, so there were creepy crawlies crawling around. If you were a fish that could use your fins to crawl out onto land, you had somewhere to hide, and you had stuff to eat. Very cool, big advantage. So, paleontologists have done some digging, and they've pulled up lots of interesting fossils that show us what some of the animals looked like in this transition from fish to things we call tetrapod, four-legged animals. This is a cladogram. On one side of the cladogram are the 36,000 species of fish represented by that terrifying lake trout that exists today. On the other side of the cladogram are a representative group of fossils that exist from fishes all the way up to tetrapods. What I wanted to know was how those early fishes at the bottom of that cladogram actually used their fins to walk on land. Now, fossils are great for telling us what an animal looks like, not so good for telling us how it behaved. So what you have to do to understand how fossils move is find something that's living today that looks like the fossil you're interested in and look at how it moves. 
So there are a few things you have to do as a fish to be able to succeed in walking. The first is breathe air. If you're going to spend any time on land, you've got to be able to breathe. You can't hold your breath the whole time. The second is you've got to be able to get your body up off the ground so that you can move forward. There's a lot of friction on your belly if you're laying there. You've got to lift yourself up. And then the last thing is you've got to be able to push yourself forward without slipping. So these are the things that we want to see in a fish. So if you go back to the cladogram, we want to find a fish that can breathe air and that can walk and that looks a lot like that fish in that picture there. What we found was polypterous. This is a lovely fish, lobey fins, long and skinny. I wanted to know two things. One, how does it use its fins to walk? Just what does it do? And then the second thing I wanted to know, which got a little bit crazy, was if you keep that fish on land and make it walk a lot, what happens to how it walks? So that's exactly what I did. I took fish, I put them on land, put some salad misters so that they were constantly getting wet, they're nice and moist, and I left them for about a year. This is what they do when they walk. Not bad for a fish, hey? You guys laugh, but come on, that's pretty good. They can actually move forward. Very cool. What's interesting is the difference between how they swim and how they walk. When they swim, they keep their bodies straight. They use their fins, but it's very straightforward. When they walk, as you saw, they flip their tail back and forth. They catapult themselves over their fin. So they've got this amazing flexibility. Put in a new environment, they do something different and interesting. Also, the animals that were raised on land for an extended period of time did a couple of very interesting things. They put their fins closer to their body midline when they walked, which allowed them to lift their bodies off the ground more. Excellent, right? That's what you want to do, reduce that friction. Also, they limited the slip they had, so when they put their fin down and moved over it, they didn't slip as much as their brothers that had been raised in a controlled aquarium setting. Very interesting, they're becoming better walkers. If you look inside the fish, something else interesting happened. The bones that support the fin changed their shape. So the bones across the chest elongated, becoming more supportive. How they attached to the bone that goes up the side of the fish got a tighter attachment, again, more supportive. If you think about it, when you're on land, you have to deal with gravity. You got to push yourself up. They're changing, their bones are changing to help support them during their walk. Very cool. So there you have it. That's the story. The little polypterists are very flexible. They can walk on land. If you keep them there for an extended period of time, they get better at walking, their bones change shape. So this sort of flexibility was probably present when fishes 400 million years ago tried to get up on land, took their first steps to get away from that scary Dunkleosteus in the competitive environment in the aquatic world. And think about this, those first steps led to the evolution of all terrestrial vertebrates, including you and me. So what we should take home from this story, be flexible, try new stuff, push your limits, and take a lesson out of our fishy ancestors. Walk even if all you have are fins, because you have no idea where it may take you. Thanks.